sorry, but because we have to drive all around the base and uh, go through security and all this, it ends up being about an hour and a half. I did have 21 years in the Air Force. I uh, flew F-4s, F-5s, the T-38 instructor flew the EB-66 in Southeast Asia. Then I'm with T. Burton, so did that aircraft, and uh, retired from uh, the Air Force, go American Airlines, went for all the security. It's Davis Mountain, one mile north of here, straight ahead in front of the bus. And uh, it was named after two first lieutenants who were killed in separate aircraft accidents in the mid-1920s, Samuel Davis and Oscar Monta. Uh, the base was dedicated in 1927. In fact, Charles Lindbergh attended the dedication ceremony. And from that time on until the beginning of World War II, it was a joint-use airfield. Uh, that means that the, both the military and civilians shared use of the airfield. World War II came along and became a training base for the B-24 Liberator Bomber air crews. And uh, after the war, uh, it was taken over by Strategic Air Command. Those are the folks flying the heavy uh, bombers. And they had B-52s, B-47s based out there, and even the U-2 spy plane was based out there at one time. And then after that, Tactical Air Command took them over, and those are the folks flying the fighters. And they flew the F-4, the F-105, uh, the A-7 Corsair, the F-100, and they uh, currently flying the A-10 Warthog out of there. And uh, they even had to, back then they had a uh, uh, C-130 squadron, an HC-130, and they still have a rescue squadron. They're flying the H-60 Blackhawk helicopter today, still being refueled in midair by HC-130s. There's another C-130 squadron based here today, and that's the EC-130 called Compass Call. Uh, they took up half of that, there's about 2,600 acres. Uh, it covers, that's about four square miles of 10.4 kilometers square. We're going to get a lot of dust up there. The yeah, aircraft don't come here to die, they come here to support other aircraft. In fact, if you see an airplane out here, that means somebody, somewhere in the world, that's of course friendly to the U.S., is flying that airplane and might need a part or even to regenerate an aircraft and fly and uh, run out of here uh, to keep their mission uh, viable. It's actually, the official name is the 309th Aerospace Maintenance and Regeneration Group, or AMARG. And they're a tenant organization here at Davis Mountain. Uh, that means they don't belong to Davis Mountain, they're just kind of renting the space here. The headquarters for the 309th is in Hill Air Force Base in Ogden, Utah. That's a major uh, depot and also a major Air Force Base there. Uh, they've been flying, I think they uh, have F-16s, and they did have some F-105s up there. And I, you know, the newest airplane, the F-35, I think maybe. On an aircraft, what's the value of those? We call it a then cost. What it cost back then when the aircraft were brand new, what it cost to buy those aircraft. And based on that, there's about $34 billion worth of aircraft in storage out here. There's around here, and you're looking at the six to eight inches of topsoil that covers a very hard clay called caliche. It's spelled C A L I C H E. There's Davis Mountain Flight Line over here to your right, and you can see some A-10s in final inspection prior to awaiting their takeoff. Uh, that caliche, that very hard clay, it is so hard, if you want to plant a garden around your house here, you need a jackhammer to get through uh, that clay. Because it is so hard, you want to find they don't have to build any cement runways, or taxiways, mechanical ramps, anything like that. They just come out here in the desert and park them uh, anywhere they want to. And they don't worry about it. Don't start to inspect the bus, then they can get back on. It shouldn't take any more about 10 minutes or so to do that. Uh, so have your ID ready. Take your water with you inside. If you want to take your electronics inside, that's okay too. You can leave everything else on the bus. It shouldn't be a problem. And today, as I said, about 3,600, and they represent about 80 different weapon systems. And the weapon systems managers in Washington, D.C., tell the folks out here what level of storage to place the aircraft in. There's three basic levels, type 1,000, 2,000, and 4,000. We'll pay more about that later on. And also, when, the, when or if you can take spare parts off the aircraft, and when or if you can restore it to flight. And, of course, the final thing is uh, when it's time to uh, as far as an aircraft, they don't tell these people out here that it's time to do that. You may wonder why they put Davis Mothin out here. Well, uh, your skin's starting to itch, that's one reason. The very, very low heat electronics that are inside. The Boeing Company is a high altitude strategic nuclear bomber. And, uh, 
They became operational in 1954, and the Air Force is still flying them. Fancy colors, the Navy used that at uh, flight dignitaries at different naval stations around the world. It's basically a modified saber liner, nice corporate aircraft. Next to us, another Navy plane. Uh, this is the, the Navy calls it a CT-12B Huron. It's basically a Beechcraft Super King Air. The largest aircraft in the world. Uh, when this, in fact, when this airplane, the C-5A Galaxy, built by Lockheed, first flew in 1970 for the next 15 years, this was the largest aircraft in the world. As I said, it's now the fifth largest aircraft. It's a strategic cargo aircraft. It has a lot of unusual features on it. The nose is hinged at the top, so you unhook, unhinge the nose, raise it up, you can roll your cargo in from the front, and in the back there's typical clamshell doors that have on most cargo aircraft, so you can uh, uh, you know, load and unload this aircraft from the front and the rear at the same time. On top, that's for air battle management. This is for ground battle management. That long tube behind the nose gear, that's a 24 foot long side looking radar. They can swim on that side by side 120 degrees and you can track anything moving more than five miles an hour up to 100 miles inside enemy territory. A crew of four flies it up front. There's anywhere from 11 to 18 crew members operating the radar and the computer in the back. And the interesting thing with this airplane is they can transmit the picture they're looking at inside uh, this airplane from the computer and the radar, transmit the battle picture down to the commanders on the ground or to the aircraft supporting the battle on the ground so everybody kind of can see what's going on all around them singing from the same page of music. Uh, submarine Hunter Killer aircraft. Very long range. In fact, prior to putting that radar underneath the fuselage, uh, one of these aircraft took off from Australia, flew nonstop, unrefueled, and landed in Ohio. Which is a very nice corporate aircraft. This sometimes accompanies the president when he's flying in the C-25, which is the Boeing 747. This is a communications backup for the president because this aircraft has EMP-hardened electronics aboard. EMP stands for Electromagnetic Pulse. Anytime a nuclear weapon goes off, or sometimes very powerful, powerful sunburst, will send down an EMP magnetic wave that would fry the electronics if they're not hardened against that kind of attack. So this has hardened uh, electronics and communications on board, and it's a backup for them. Uh, this is a B-52H model. There's about 76 of them still in service today. This particular airplane has a very interesting story behind it. And when Francis Powers was shot down in high altitude, the Air Force says, we better find a low-level way to get to the target. So the uh, Air Force loaned this airplane to the Boeing Company. Boeing contractor pilots were flying at low level through the Rocky Mountains. They encountered some clear air turbulence. That knocked off 80% of the vertical stabilizer. Now you lose the tail like that, you're going to crash. But the crews made judicial use of the outboard thrust, the outboard engines alternating the thrust, dropped only the aft landing gear to stabilize it. Another problem they had, they lost 2,000 pounds of the tail, so the CG moved rapidly forward, the center of gravity, so they had to transfer fuel rapidly back and forth. They flew at six hours in that condition, and then landed at the base in Arkansas, and they fixed it and flew it again until they brought it here to the boneyard. Coming up next on the right is our F-117 Nighthawk stealth fighter. It's a uh, cloudy as a Navy would fly it. Uh, it's based on the Lockheed Electra airliner design. Instead of piston engines, these have jet engines turning the propellers. So they call it a turboprop. They go on about a 13 or 14 hour mission and they spend almost all of that time at 100 feet or less over the water. Sometimes they even shut down one of the engines in flight to extend the range. That's the official name. It was originally built as a tactical nuclear bomber. The Navy only used that role a couple of years. Then they modified them to hold conventional bombs. The Navy did use it in that role, bombing in the uh, targets in Vietnam. And, uh, and then they converted quite a few of them into electronic warfare airplanes and dedicated aerial tankers. Well, so what the Navy called it is actually a Douglas DC-8 airliner. In fact, the Navy bought that from United Airlines. They stuffed the back end with a whole bunch of black boxes. Then they'd fly around the fleet, jamming all their radars and communications so the fleet could see what it's like to operate in simulated wartime conditions, all their fancy gear being jammed by another aircraft. 60s and all other air ground fighter bomber. Uh, if you ever saw the movie Flight in the Intruder, it featured an aircraft like that in that movie. Uh, that thing sticking out the nose is a refueling probe. The Navy uses probe and drone refueling. So when you refuel behind a Navy airplane, you fly it behind the tanker in close trail, and the tanker's trailing a drogue with a long hose. The drogue looks like a giant badminton birdie. When you want to transfer fuel, you plug the probe into the drogue and you transfer your fuel. It was the most accurate fighter bomber used in the Vietnam War. Uh, 
It had a very accurate dive bomb computer on board that took into account the aircraft altitude, airspeed, and dive angle would automatically release the weapons for an accurate impact on the ground. Skyhawk. It's so small the air crews named it a tinker toy. Sometimes they call it a scooter. This is the type of aircraft that Arizona Senator John McCain was flying when he shot down over North Vietnam, and he spent five and a half years as a POW, courtesy of the Hanoi Hilton. That means it's designed for a special mission, and it looks like there's a very bad paint job on it. Well, it's painted that way on purpose because this airplane over here on the left was the targeting aircraft when they were testing the airborne laser. A Boeing 747 had an airborne laser, and they would use this aircraft as the target, so they needed to paint it all different kind of colors so they could ascertain where the targeting uh, picture was uh, using that airborne laser. Uh, this is designed and pushed by an Air Force colonel named Colonel John Boyd in the mid-1970s. He invented an inexpensive single-engine, single-seat day fighter. Build a whole lot of them for cheap and you fly them all around and overwhelm the enemy. Well, the Air Force likes to modify the airplanes to do many different missions, so this does what they call a swing low. It is still a very good air-to-air -air fighter, has a good air radar on it. Also a pretty good air-to-ground fighter bomber. Go to the spray lab. This is the F-18 Hornet, the primary fleet defense fighter used by the Navy today. So they said they're using the Super Hornet today, basically the same design airframe, but a little bit larger, carries more fuel and munitions. You'll see some of these without the bag on it here in just a few minutes. This is the oldest flying military aircraft prior to coming here for storage. The Navy flew this out of Point Magoo, California, launching target drones. Uh, the Air Force used DC-130s, the Vietnam War, to launch target uh, 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 reconnaissance drones uh, over enemy territory. They took a fire bee drone and modified it, put cameras on it. They launch it and fly autonomous routes over enemy territory. When it coasted out over friendly country, the engine was shut down and deployed a parachute. And the A6 navigation system has taken longer to train their navigators. So the Navy took this airplane, put the A6 radar on the nose. There's six A6 navigator stations in the back, and they can train six navigators at once in the TC-4C academic. Purple Heart was invented by George Washington to give to troops wounded in combat. You don't give it to hunk of metal. This airplane was sitting on a ramp in Southeast Asia and uh, came in a motor attack, knocked out the number three engine. Well, they repaired the engine while they're under attack and then fired them all up and on the takeoff roll, another mortar went off near the tail, blew a whole bunch of holes in the tail. They flew around about uh, 10 minutes that condition, landed all over the airfield. The crew got out, looked at all the damage, and says, boy, this thing needs a Purple Heart. So it has a purple heart hanging from the instrument panel in the cockpit. The Navy version of that, the E2C Hawkeye over here on the left, you can see the ray dome on top of it. Two crew members flying up front, three crew members operate the radar and the computer in the back. This airplane's carrier base, it can survey up 20,000 targets, track 2,000 targets, and direct up to 100 either air-to-air -air combat missions or air-to-ground combat missions. Are on the tail, because it is used by their aggressor squadron. The Navy and the Air Force both use aggressor squadrons uh, uh, to, uh, in their top gun schools and the aggressor pilots eat, sleep, think enemy tactics 24 hours a day. Then they go out and fly amongst their squadron mates using those strictly enemy tactics and hopefully a dissimilar aircraft so their friends can see what it's like operating in simulated wartime condition with a pilot using strictly enemy tactics. AC-14, one means it's a prototype. Boeing McDonnell Douglas each built prototypes to replace the Lockheed C-130. In the Vietnam War, the Air Force wanted to replace the Lockheed C-130 with a jet-powered short-field takeoff and landing cargo airplane. This is Boeing's uh, version. Those things under the wing are flap hinges, had huge wing flaps to extend the surface area of the wing to add lift. Another elevated feature to put those turbofan engines on top of the wing, blow hot air over the surface wing, that it would add lift. Reportedly, this aircraft could take off and land in less than 2,000 feet. That's Huey Cobra, used by the Air Force and the Army in Vietnam. Uh, it's a gunship, that, that uh, chin underneath the nose, that's a Gatling gun. A pilot would fly it in the back, a gunner would sit in the front and operate the weapon systems. The Navy version that's next to it, the AH-1JC Cobra. The difference in the two, the Navy version has twin engines, two engines, and the Air Force and Army has a single engine. Valley Green Giant, or outside at the museum we have one called Paved Low. It has all kinds of fancy equipment on board that allows them to fly at night at treetop level and in all kinds of weather without overseeing the ground. Use it to rescue pilots behind enemy lines or insert troops, uh, combat troops into combat. Let's also insert troops. 
And uh, those of us old enough remember it was also Marine One at one time. The Marines would hire a president to win the White House and Camp David. Over here on the left, this is our last uh, aircraft here in Celebrity Row is the OV-1 Mohawk. It's the only fixed-wing turboprop aircraft the Army flew in the Vietnam War. The Army used, uh, we shrink wrap them. The smaller turbojet engines, we put in what we call engine cans, these canisters right here, put the engine in there, close the lid, seal it up, suck the air out, fill it with argon and nitrogen. If we're not going to store the engine for later use, we just drop them in what we call a half can. We just leave the lid open drop the engine in there. Once you salvage the expensive parts off of it, then you can destroy the rest of it. Here's some engine half cans here on the right. Well, for foreign military services, there's some Norwegian airline, uh, Norwegian uh, Air Force ones here. This one coming up with Idaho on the tail, Air National Guard. This is an HC-130. Those pods at the end of each wing, that's where you put those drogues trailing on a long hose. They will fuel two helicopters at once using the HC-130. There's that Norwegian Air Force uh, C-130. Here on the right, all these F-16s are in the queue. Pilots also, instead of the Fighting Falcon, they also call these the Viper, and uh, sometimes they call it the uh, the electric jet, because it's the first all-fly-by-wire fighter that the Air Force flew. Uh, if they're not going to do that, uh, I mean, then they go to the wash rack where they're cleaned up. Then I told you about that process where they cover wide seams and holes with wires and let them be Lancers. These are supersonic uh, nuclear bombers. Uh, again, these are variable geometry wing aircraft. That means the wings sweep back and forth at different stages of flight. These white tanks beside these right here, those are uh, uh, ferry fuel tanks. If you're going to ferry this a long range and uh, you're not going to haul any bombs, you put those in the bomb bay and you can fly a long range. It wouldn't fit in the hangar underneath the flight deck because I had to hinge the tail so it fit in the hangar. Now, some more C-5A galaxies. If you don't see two letters on the tail of an Air Force airplane, but you see a city, town, or a state, that means it's usually flown by the Air National Guard or reserves. Chop the wings off of it, chop the fuselage in three different sections, then they have to sit there a minimum of 90 days. That allows the Soviets to fly overhead their satellites, take pictures, count them, and see that we're destroying our nuclear delivery systems in accordance with those treaties. And for some reason, so we'd like to come over here and inspect these personally in January and February. The engines, we'll compare these with the newer ones in just a minute. Now, we normally don't uh, store or buy civilian aircraft. You can see two, two Boeing 707s coming up here on the right. The Air Force bought a bunch of these 707s from the airlines, flew them in here, paid $300,000 a piece for them, took the engines off, re-engined the KC-135, and improved the capability one and a half times and saved $4 million per airplane. It's much larger than the older models. And you can see an AWACS. You see the radar on it, and NATO AWACS there. They built 35 of those, and they're still using them today. They have a stinger sticking out the tail. Large sheds in the difference. This is those are all rollers. You can roll those over of the airplane while you're working on them. Keep out of the elements. We don't have much corrosion due to, the, uh, to uh, high humid conditions, but we do have corrosion due to bird activity. Bird dune hanging out inside there. You know, when this, uh, the Air Force, uh, the government shut down a few years ago, this place did not shut down. It makes or saves the government money. Prime example is a few years ago, they, they filled 15,000 parts requests that made or saved the government one half billion dollars, five hundred million dollars. For every dollar spent here, they get about seventeen dollars in return. The McDonnell Douglas built these under contract. The Marines bought them because they could bed them down next to the troops in combat because you don't need a runway. Those will take off vertically, fly backwards in the air. Pretty good air to air fighter once you get everything going in the same direction. You can see four different versions of those outside at the Air Museum. The Air Force can safely fly to Jacksonville, Florida. And the Boeing company has the contract there to install the remote controls. And from there, they fly them, uh, they fly them to Tyndall Air Force Base, and then they fly them out of the Gulf of Mexico and let uh, fighters practice intercepts with them. They don't shoot them down right away. Sometimes you get as many as 300 hours on the airframe. But when it's no longer economically feasible, to get up, loosen up the spray line and take it off. See, if there's some spray light work being done on that gunship. See out there to the right? You can see they're putting the electrical tape all over it right now. 
So you can see the first stage of uh, doing that work right there. And you can fly that boom up and down and side to side. Inside the foot, the uh, boom is a 20-foot probe. When you're in proper position, the boom operator flies the boom into position, puts the probe into your refueling receptacle and transfer fuel. And this white rocket coming up on the right is called an Athena rocket, or an RTV, which stands for Reentry Training Vehicle. This is the only rocket ever fired from the interior of the United States. They fired from Green River, Utah, and enter outer space and re-enter the Earth's atmosphere over White Sands, New Mexico. And DY on the tail, uh, that's from Dias Air Force Base, that's another B-1B Lancer bomber. Uh, again, that's very good geometry. The Air Force is still flying those B-1s today. Uh, they're no longer carrying nuclear weapons, but use them for high altitude uh, it's the, uh, bombing missions and very uh, accurate bombing and using smart bombs based on the coordinates called in from the ground. Uh, they can bomb the corner of a building from 30,000 feet. The Navy's still using these today for hunting submarines. Northrop uh, wanted uh, four million dollars to store the tooling out here. We have it in storage out here for two hundred thousand dollar one time cost. And then if you need some spare parts, and it's out of production, you have a, a way to, uh, to produce the spare parts that you might need to keep your aircraft in flight. 